Okay, um, we're going to get started. My name is Jules Damji. First, buenos dias. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Now, some of you probably attended uh, yesterday Matthias Zaharia, my esteemed uh, co-founder of uh, Databricks, and he gave a talk on MLflow. So some of these are going to be a bit repetitive, but I believe the repetition is good for you to agree. It's part of reinforcement learning. So some of the slides might be repetition, and then we'll actually get into the more neaty details of how to use the MLflow API. So this is what our um, schedule is going to be like. I'm going to talk about the challenges of some of the machine learning problems that most of you actually are, are working with. You know, what are some of the challenges? You know, how is it different from, say, doing software development engineering in, in, in the normal sense of the word? And then I'm going to talk about how MLflow tries to address this. Not that MLflow is the first one, but it tries to address it in a very unique way. And then I'm going to talk about in detail what are some of the components that comprise of MLflow. And then finally, we'll actually get into a demo where I talk about how do you actually use the neural networks using Keras and Python to create a baseline model, which is very normally the case when you're actually comparing models and doing experiments, and then create a statistical power whereby we know that a baseline model gives you enough uh, accuracy, but we want to somehow tune parameters and how do we actually do that using MFO API to experiment and then compare some of the models as we go along. And then I'll, I'll um, uh, end with a, a particular roadmap. Now, how many of you actually are uh, Python programmers here in this room? Brilliant. Anybody use Keras and TensorFlow? Lovely, okay. So what we're going to be doing is building three models using Keras uh, and then, and then um, uh, looking at how we can actually tune the parameters. But the important part is not as much as, as learning how to do neural network, but how MLflow can actually help you in tracking the experiments as we move forward. Now, yesterday you hear about that machine learning is actually complex, right? It is not something that, that uh, is very similar or very, very, very same as your normal software development cycle. There are a lot of different steps involved. There are a lot of different stages involved. And it's a very iterative process, which means that you have to repeat certain things. And it's not like you're just using one set of tools. You're using myriad set of tools. You're using different kinds of parameters. You're using things at scale. And it's imperative that you have the ability to reproduce certain experiments. And it's very imperative for you to be able to actually somehow uh, ex export that particular model. So that in itself um, uh, in introduces a number of complexities which uh, somehow make this task very complex. Now, this is a quintessential cycle of a repetitive things that you actually do in machine learning. You got the data preparation part, you get the training, you deploy, and then eventually you move to the uh, raw data and monitoring of the particular model. Now, each stage has its unique challenges, right? Each stage has its unique challenges, what those are. Well, for one, in data preparation, you will have loads of tools, right? Unlike software development, you might just have one database, or you might have just one streaming engine from which you're actually extracting data and you're doing some feature engineering. But over here, because of the fact that we have today multiple sources of data coming from different, different directions, you won't be able to actually use the most of the state-of-the-art um, uh, data sources that could be SQL database, that could be Kafka, that could be streaming engines, that could be Flink, uh, that could be Python, pandas that you want to use. And so each of these actually have uh, a different configurations you got to worry about. So that's stage number one. You want to use best of the tools, and you want to be able to actually say, I want to use a particular algorithm of choice that is conducive to the problem I'm trying to solve. So that's challenge number one. The second challenge is that each of these have different requirements in terms of how you actually tune, and especially those of you who are actually familiar with with machine learning algorithms, you have the ability to actually do hyperparameter tuning. You have the ability to actually change some of the parameters that actually affect the metrics. And as you explore what are some of the tuning parameters, that actually can move the needle in terms of getting you know, two or three percent accuracy on your validation loss or drop of that on your validation loss. So accuracy actually makes a huge difference in your revenue and also on the confidence of your uh, prediction model as you uh, put it into production. So number two challenge is that you got to have tuning parameters and then how do you actually track all these parameters? You, know, you might use five or different parameters that you want to use and eventually if you're happy with the eventual outcome of that particular result, you won't be able to reproduce that and be able to track that somehow. And so there's challenge number two. There are different kinds of parameters and you've got to worry about that. The third thing is scale. We are sort of entering the zeitgeist of big data. In other words, big data now is actually a nomenclature that, that we see every day. 
And things happen at scale. And I would contend that the more data you actually have, whether you're using deep learning uh, frameworks, whether you're using deep learning models, or whether you're using traditional machine learning models, the more data you have, the chances are that you'll have a better accuracy because your training model can actually look at data that actually you hadn't seen. And if you have a large validation set, then you can actually have a confidence that whatever I've trained on something, uh, I can actually get a fairly good high accuracy on the unseen data. So having a large set of data at scale is important. And scale is important not only on, on one stage of the machine learning cycle, scale is actually important throughout. Because after you have done the train, you're going to do a deploy. And then when you're done deploy, you actually put it out in the raw production. And you're going to be monitoring data, how your model is actually working. And you might incorporate some of the new features that come in, because data changes, features changes, and you might have to retrain the model. And so this particular cycle actually repeats itself. So the challenge number two is that you've got to worry about scale. Um, and, and, and that's an important part of it. The third thing is, um, once you're done as a machine learning developer, you're going from um, you know, feature engineering to training, and now you're going to hand off the model exchange to your ops guy, and how he or she is going to take that particular model and ensure that the model that you actually hand over is the one that you actually experimented, the one you actually tested, and the one you were happy with, so that he or she can actually deploy it and you can actually monitor and then re-repart that. So modal exchange is an important part in this entire repetitive cycle. And then finally, you know, we are living in, in an era that, that GDPR is now an imperative part, especially in the EU and also in the United States, where your private data is actually something very personal, and, and a lot of companies have had problem uh, either selling their data or inadvertently exposing your personal data. And so it's very important for you when you deploy a particular model, you have an accountability, you have a governance, you have a prominence. You want to make sure that when you deploy the particular model, you have the ability at any point in any time to be able to query that. Who ran the particular model, when it was run, what data was used, and so on and so forth. So collectively, these are kind of things that daily people who are doing development in their life cycle encounter that. And people do their own quote unquote MFLOW internal tools whereby uh, track that. They might do it on a spreadsheet, they might do it in a JSON file, and then they have to somehow create a, a report to sign out, oh, well, these are the tuning parameters used, these are my configuration, this is where the data came from, this is the code version that I actually used to create that model. And all that bookkeeping can actually be taken care of a tool such as that allows you to keep tracking. And when we were doing research, when we were talking out to developers, when we were talking out to customers to find out what is it and how they're actually doing it. And it was very, not very dissimilar to what we actually would automate that. And this was one of the quotes that actually came from one of the very chief data scientists who say, you know, we develop models on a daily basis, you know, 100 to 200 models, and we have data scientists who are R programmers, we have data scientists who are Java programmers, we have data scientists who are statisticians and, and, and and ML developers who uh, swear by Python, they don't use anything else. We want to be able to actually pre uh, create tools so that we can actually deploy them, and it becomes like a religious war, whether we, whether we, which one should we actually use. And so in order to do that, um, we had to somehow come up with a model or come up with a strategy or come up with a scheme that actually addresses some of the things. Now, you might ask at this particular point, Jules, what's the problem, right? I mean, if this is such a problem, why people actually haven't solved it? And it turns out that people have, you know. There are large companies out there who actually do this on a very frequent daily basis. They go out um, uh, developing tools. And so we did some research to find out how these big companies, Facebook has got enormous amount of data. You know, they have machine learning models that, that, that they, they deploy on a daily basis. It's not only one model, they have several models, and they do a lot of A-B testing. And how do you actually try track all the different requirements that actually, how do you actually track all the parameters to do that? So they have their own internal tool called FB Learner, which is fine because it standardizes the way they, 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 they train the model, they deploy it, and how they actually monitor it, which is good because now we can actually learn something from it. Um, Uber is another one that came with the Michelangelo, which is very similar in terms of that allows them to be able to do all that. And so, so is Google. I mean, when you talk about Google, what do you think about? You think about scale, right? These guys are dealing with scale amount of data and with the TFX extended server that can actually deploy various kinds of TensorFlow model, not only on one architecture, but also on your mobile phone, also on Raspberry Pi, surprisingly. And, and all these are requirements that do. The only problem over there is that while it's true that they give you the ability to actually do this, 
But they're limited in terms of the choice of algorithms you need, the choice of frameworks that you need, the choice of programming languages, because they will adopt the one that's commonly used within their company, which actually suits their network. And they're tied to the company's infrastructure. So when you leave the company, what happens? Right? You lose that intellectual property. And I remember one particular anecdote when I was running a meetup in San Francisco, and I had a, a guy from Facebook who, who was a data scientist who actually gave, me, gave a talk in how he was actually doing A-B testing and, and, and uh, calculating the sentiment analysis on the comments, right? When you look at a Facebook comment, you said like, or you might comment, and they want to find out, how do you actually do sentiment analysis on this? And he actually gave a very uh, eloquent presentation on how he actually does that. And at the, end, at the end, I asked him, you know, what was the underlying library you actually used? Did you use uh, Spark MLlib? Did you use this particular algorithm? And he was dumbfounded. He couldn't answer the question. He goes, you know, we actually have a very abstraction layer. Where all I do is I create all these high-level de declaratives in my file. I said, I want to use a logistic regression. I want to use this particular function. I want to use, here's my data. Go ahead and create a model for me, and then run the model and give me the results. So that's a high-level abstraction. Now, if he left somewhere, and he, went, he wouldn't be able to do that. Same thing with Google's um, uh, Borg. Uh, which is a massive scale in how you actually do provisioning. And when people left Google and went to Twitter, they couldn't provision things because the board didn't exist. It was a very platform that was very specific. So we decided, what is it we can actually learn from this that standardized things, but we want to do it in a very open manner, so that when you leave the particular company, you don't have to worry about taking the intellectual property, but you can do that in an open manner. And one of the ideas behind open manner actually came from the Apache Spark uh, community, because the founders who created MLflow are also the founders who actually created Apache Spark. And they learned a lot from the fact that doing things in an open manner is where the innovation happens. Because if you look at historically how open source has actually changed the world, innovation happens in collaboration. It doesn't happen in isolation. And that was the principle behind what we decided to do, was to keep this in an open manner so you can actually do that very easily. And thus came MLflow. And MLflow was, was created with a couple of things in mind. One was that we wanted to have the ability to actually run any algorithm you actually need, any particular uh, framework you wanted to use, any language if you don't have language wars. We wanted to be able to run in any particular environment locally, because a lot of people, developers, run things on PyCharm or, the, or use IDE. At the same time, run it uh, on, on the cluster as well, or on a, on a large scale. We wanted to make it very simple. We want to make it easy to use. And I think the developers are where, where the power is. They are the new kingmakers. And you provide them simple APIs. You provide them modularity so that they can build things on their own. You really have their minds and hearts. And we always have wanted to keep developers first. And that was the, the design philosophy. And the design philosophy is very simple, API first. If you look at history, history, how APIs have actually changed in how you actually build something, you look at Unix, for example. C API changed completely how people started writing stuff. You could write shared libraries. You could by window managers, you all ran on the same platform. Why? Because there was a C interface to the kernel, there was a C interface to the application layer, there was a C interface, very well-defined signatures in C that you can actually write those applications. Take an example, Java, right? Java came in the in, in, in late 90s and it completely exploded the world. Why? Because of the APIs, right? Developers love the APIs. So we wanted to stick with that idea is that you give them the APIs, make them simple, make them modular. So that was the first design philosophy, that was the principle and the, and, and the requirement that we actually did that. And this sort of allows people to be able to actually build these things using the APIs and REST APIs as well. The second part was that we wanted to actually make it modular in that we didn't want this particular tool to be monolithic, right? We wanted to actually have modular tools so they can use it distinctively or independently or they can actually use it collaborative to create an entire ML flow structure. So there was a whole idea behind that. Keep it distinct keep it um, um, uh, less monolithic, and keep it simple. And the whole idea is, if you, if, if you have something that's decoupled, you can actually build things like that. And that's how Unix was built. You got shell, you got all these different commands that you can actually do. You can stick together, and now you have a full-blown application. And so that sort of was the principle and the proponent proposition behind, behind MLflow. And that's how we actually went forward and did that. And if you look at the MLflow components, there are actually three very distinct components that can be used independently or that can be used together. Right? So the MLflow tracking allows you to track your APIs, allows you to track all the hyperparameter tuning, allows you to track and persist 
all the uh, parameters that you use, all the um, uh, models that you actually use. And so that is a very simple API. You take that API, you, 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 you track it. And the second thing was project. And project is, is a way for us to be able to encapsulate your entire existing project as your, as your, as your model. And that project can become a unit of execution in, in any particular environment because we wanted to sort of encapsulate. Think of project as a Docker file, right? Docker file has all the dependencies that you actually need. And once you actually deploy the Docker in the container manner, you can run pretty much anything. So that was the idea behind Docker, that the project is a very simple way to express those things. And that way we can actually encapsulate all these different models in this particular project. And then finally, the third one is model. And think about model as a way, just like, just like project, where you can exp express the model in one particular flavor. And the a flavor could be a TensorFlow model, a flavor could be a Keras model, a flavor could be an MLlib model. And for us to be able to actually requirement to have all these ML, ML models, if we supported all of them in their own different particular format, we would actually have an N by N matrix multiplication. So if we actually somehow use that idea by saying, well, why don't we come up with a convention where we can actually express a model in particular flavor, and then that flavor can actually run in any environment where, actually, where that, that flavor is actually supported. So let's look at tracking. Um, there are a few concepts in tracking that people worry about, and, and those are normally parameters. Those are things that, that you want to track. Those are key value pairs you can actually use. Um, numeric values are matrix that you actually want to capture. So there might be, say, for example, a uh, root mean square error that you actually got that you want to track. You might want to keep track of the binary loss. You might want to keep track of the validation loss. Those are the metrics that you care about. Those are the things that actually move your needle. Those are the things that make a difference in your model. Uh, there might be tags and notes. notes those are sort of, you know, uh, oh, here's a note for, for a reminder for me to have actually remember something. And those are, um, the, the artifacts are things that the model uses. Uh, this could be files, this could be a code version, this could be data from where, where you actually did the preparation. This could be any number, this could be source code, this could be a Git re re revision that you actually use. It could be the model you actually saved. Those, those are the artifacts. And the sources is, you know, what was the source? What was the origin in where it actually did? And then version is obviously what version of the code. So those are the essential things that people want to be able to track it so that when the model is created with this particular experiment, I can always go back and exactly find out where the particular model is. And the tracking API is very simple, right? If you're a Python, this is a Python code, all you have to do is import MLflow. And then using the compound uh, statement, such as with the current run, go ahead and log this parameter, log that parameter, log this particular metric, and so on and so forth. And so very simple API that allows you to do things. And finally, uh, tracking has this notion that I can have a tracking server running locally on my machine, or I can have a tracking server running somewhere remotely on the cluster where I can actually do the tracking. Invariably, if you're a developer, you're going to be doing things locally, and then finally um, uh, setting the tracking to run on, on a particular remote server, which could be production or which could be dev. And those can be run in three different ways, right? You can actually run in your notebooks, whether you're using Databricks notebooks or whether you're using uh, Jupyter notebooks. If you have MLflow installed as part of the package, then you can just import those and from your notebooks that go ahead and do the tracking. Or you can actually have local application on PyCharm that actually just says tracking server is, is here, go ahead and run it, or tracking server is not set, so I'm just gonna do everything locally, and once I'm happy with it, I can actually uh, do the experiment, run remotely. Or it can actually be part of the cloud job, whereby you might have a cron job that's actually running, that's running this model on a daily basis to do the training and then tracking all the experiments remotely. And that's sort of governed by these two attributes. You know, you can actually, on the command line, you can actually say, here's my, here's my environment variable, um, uh, go ahead and, and run this experiment and put all the data on the tracking server. And if this environment variable is run and I'm running locally, it's going to create an ML run directly locally, and you'll have all the experiments there. And then, or you can actually set it in your, um, in your, in your model where you're actually doing the experimenting, where you say set the tracking to be somewhere else, and now you actually go in and do it. So that's sort of a tracking. Uh, we wanted to be able to take 
this motivation and take it one further and say, well, you know, the motivation behind creating projects as an independent way and a, as, as a way to express that was the ability to create this project uh, file called a project format. And this project format encapsulate what your, what your project is, what your model is, what flavor it is. And that way, this allows us to be able to run this flavor on any particular machine. And it makes the productionizing a lot easier, and it makes it uh, 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 easier to manage. You don't have to create thousands of different project files or different kinds of projects, because one is Keras, and one is Scikit, and one is the other one. You have one project that expresses what your project is, and it becomes your unit of execution. And so the idea behind project is very simple. I can actually run it locally, or I can run it remotely. And think of project as a Docker file, right? I express my execution or mode of execution in my project file, then I deploy that in a container, and it downloads all the necessary uh, dependencies that I have, and it can actually run. So that's the whole idea behind every project. And it encapsulates three very important things that comprises your model, the code that you actually use to do that, the configurations that you actually use that, and the data, or the files where you actually got the data from. It could be a Kafka server, it could be a, a SQL database, it could be HDFS a path where you actually have large amounts of data where you actually use to, to train your particular model. And those of you who are come from the Unix background, the file project is very simple, right? It's, it's, it could be part of your Git repository where the name of the ML project is, you know, uh, Keras uh, IMD classifier. And then the project file is just nothing but the YAML file that says, here are my entry points when you run this particular project. And if I give you the parameters, use this default parameters or use this Python code to execute that. And the Conda environment is a Conda YAML file that says, if you're running this using the ML flow git from a git repository, the Conda environment tells you what dependencies are, what packages you actually need. It's going to download. It's going to create a Python environment. It's going to create a Conda environment and download those uh, packages that you need. And you actually have a self-sustained um, project running where you can actually do that uh, uh, similarly. So it's a very um, sort of very easy, intuitive way to express what your project is. And you can run project. Uh, in a number of ways, right? You can say, on the command line, I can say ML for a run. And if somebody has published this project on a Git repository, if I just go to the Git repository, it will download it on my local environment. It will use, it will ascertain from the, uh, from the Conda YAML that I need these packages, and I need SciPy, I need Pandas, and I need TensorFlow, I need Keras. It will download those, and it will run in that particular uh, uh, Conda environment or a virtual Python environment and, and do the tracking experiment depending on where the tracking server is. So it's very flexible, it's very powerful, it's very simple conceptually to actually uh, 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 understand that. So that sort of is the idea behind project. And then the ML models. Now this was um, something that, that initially we had um, a, a bit of difficulty how to articulate, but, but the, the way I look at it is MLflow models allows you just like the Docker file, and I'm using this analogy over and over again, is because models, just like projects, are a way to express how that particular flavor is. Now, the models could be a flavor of Keras, so it could be any of the um, uh, deep learning frameworks or machine learning libraries that you perform. And, and once we encapsulate that particular flavor, you can think of this flavor as a lambda function. Those of you who are Python programmers understand what lambda function is. You actually take that lambda function, you deploy it, Anywhere that's, that's running Python, and you just have one function called predict, and you can actually use that particular predict function. Or you can actually have the flavor, say TensorFlow, that's running on that particular Docker environment. And if TensorFlow is there, it will know that I'm, I'm running a TensorFlow code. I'm going to load that particular model using the TensorFlow HD format or Keras, and I'm going to execute my predict function given the particular output. So that sort of allows us to do that. How many of you use Apache Arrow? Anybody use Apache Arrow? So Apache Arrow is, is very similar in terms of, in terms of a deserializing and serializing Pandas frame to allow applications to run on JVM. So instead of actually JVM trying to understand, I'm going to have um, uh, mlib, I'm going to have uh, um, uh, mlib function, I'm going to have uh, 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 Avro function, I'm going to have all these different formats to understand. Avro is an exchange format, whereas I'm just going to have one format, and the JVM will know that you're actually using um, the, the arrow format to serialize and deserialize. So in a very way, it's, it's very similar where you can actually exchange the model. And if you look at the modal file, it's quite simple. Um, you know, you have the model that says when the model was actually created, um, uh, time it was created, and what flavor it is, right? So I can actually use 
TensorFlow where I'm deploying this particular model to say, well, I, this is a TensorFlow model, so I can load using the TensorFlow API to load that particular model it was saved, and I can use whatever the model API on the TensorFlow is to predict, to evaluate, to, to, to do whatever I actually want with a particular model. And the second is a very generic model called Python Flavor that is very generic. They can run anywhere where Python is running as a Py function, as a Lambda function. So those are the sort of the two, two flavors that, that allows you to deploy this model anywhere where either you have the ability to run Python or you have the model target on an environment with TensorFlow, Keras, uh, Spark, MLlib, and so on and so forth. So I think this is a um, time where uh, you get to see some code, because I know yesterday there the, were the, a lot of high-level stage, so I thought today I would spend the next 15 minutes I have uh, on, on code. Now, it's going to be quite challenging, because um, it's going to be hard for me to type, but I'll try. Um, so what's my model? You might want to take a picture of this, because you can actually go home and, and, and look at the GitHub if you missed some parts of it that actually has a notebook that allows you to do that. There's a blog associated with that. And all the code that I'm going to show you today is there, so I don't have to uh, endlessly uh, trip over wires while I'm talking and uh, have this cell tape here. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to create three Keras models. We'll create the baseline model that says, okay, this is my baseline model, and, and once I have the baseline model, I look at the accuracy to see whether it actually makes sense. And I'm going to use now two experiments, experiment one, experiment two, where I'm changing the hyperparameter tune to see what, how, how is the needle moving. Do I have a better accuracy? Do I have a lower a loss? Is my model overfitting? Things of that sort. And these are the things you ask when you're actually experimenting, and you want to capture all the parameters available. So we have, we'll have a neural network that actually looks like this. We have an input layer that's going to take the IMD classifier as a vector of input from the Keras um, uh, vectorized uh, as tensors, and we'll have a number of hidden layers. We can experiment with the hidden layers. And the last layer is going to be an output layer, which is sigmoid as your function. And, and those of you who are familiar with active function sigmoid, it gives you the ability to actually give you a probability of what your classification is between 0 and 1. And so anything that's above 0 0.5, we'll say it's good. Anything below, it's going to be um, 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 a good API. I mean, a good prediction. All right, so let's look at that. So what I'm going to do now is, if the demo goes out with me, could we uh, switch to my screen? I can't seem to see uh, my browser. Do I have to do anything different over here? Because I can't seem to see my browser. OK. So the demo goes are not with me. So what I'm going to do instead is, is, is run this experiment on, um, on, my, on, on my laptop. And what I'm doing, I'm going to actually th create three particular models. One is the, is, is the one which is a base experiment. Oh, actually, you can see it. Yeah, but I'm trying to go to the, um, the system preferences. Yeah. No, no, I actually want that. I want, I want this particular screen, you know, the, the browser, so I can type things in. OK, looks like the demo gods are not with me today, and I can't seem to find my stuff. But the whole idea is, is
I tried this before. Yeah, I'm not getting. Does anybody know how to actually um, change the preferences so I can actually uh, show the uh, the demo? I can't seem to get the get the browser up. I want to I want to be able to actually see the um, the the screen over here for that particular browser. See the Chrome. That's where I actually have the experiment. So I can actually show. No, the browser is here, the Chrome. Yeah. But I can't see, I can't see it over here, right? So if you just, yeah, yeah. So if you actually go to, to preferences and mirror it, I should be able to see that over here. Changes, yeah, or no. Yeah, bring it over here. Brilliant. All right. So um, in the interest of time, I actually have these experiments that were actually running already. And what I've done essentially is I have, I've got nine minutes. I'm going to end it right quickly. Um, can you guys see this? You can't see it. Oh, dear. OK. All right, this is unfortunate. I should be able to see it. I can see it on my screen, but I can't seem to get to uh, show the mirror. Okay, so just to give you an idea, I mean, if you look at this particular code here, I can't even, I can't even look at that particular thing. All right, um, what I'm going to do is, is probably take any questions you have. I think the important part was to actually show you a demo how to actually use that. Um, I'm going to be at the Databricks booth, or I'm going to hang around here after that, and I can actually show you personally. But the whole idea is we actually create the experiments. We, we launched the, the MLflow UI to actually look at the experiments and see how we actually lowered the metrics and how we actually do the loss function. So I have a few questions that, that I have some time. I can ask, answer any questions they actually have. Uh, unfortunately, the demo gods are not with me. I can't seem to mirror the preferences. Otherwise, this would have been a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, exercise. But I can also show you later on if you stop by the booth. Any questions you have? Yes. Hi, nice talk. Thank you. So our stack is based on Python, Scylar Kit, Scylar Kit. Uh, um, we deploy with Docker, mm -hmm. and our format is Joblib. Mm -hmm. Is this MF ML flow compatible with that? Yeah, so if you're using Scikit Learn uh, as one of the frameworks, one of the flavors that we actually support, you can actually save the model as an MLlib model, and they can deploy that as an MLlib model, and it will save both as an MLlib or as a pickle uh, in, in, in scikit-learn, whichever way you actually want. So if you're using scikit-learn, you have two choices. You can save it as an MLlib model, which will use the, uh, the, the MLlib format to store it, or you can actually use the scikit pickle that actually use that. And depending on where you are storing on the Docker, you can load it scikit, uh, using scikit um, API to load the particular model. It will load the pickle file if you saved it as a scikit file. Or if you just leave it as MLlib, then you can just use the MLlib model, load it, and then just provide the data frame uh, as a pandas data frame to your predict in the, in, the, in the model, and you get all your results. I wish I actually had the demo. It would have been actually worth it, but I apologize for that. All right, any other question do you have? Yes. Thanks for your talk. Uh, Thank you. Are there any plans for the MLflow project to run on, on Microsoft platforms? Well, actually, yes. We have, we have the, the ability to run MLflow um, uh, on Azure Databricks. That so actually runs on Azure Databricks. It runs on, uh, you can deploy your models on Azure ML, right? And we can also deploy models on AWS SageMaker. So yes, it actually runs on, on Microsoft uh, Azure ML. So if you, we, with, 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 with the current version, we provide you the Docker files that you can actually run on, on Azure ML. So any model that you actually save, um, you can be de deployed in, in Azure ML as well. Oh, 
nice. And that's the CNTK from Microsoft, like TensorFlow works. Do you have any flavor for that? So CNTK is on the list right now. We support the, uh, the most popular ones. But if you feel that, that, that uh, there is a need for, for CNTK, again, this is an open source project. And I think it's people like you, really, who, who actually make a difference. And we want to be able to actually do that, whereby you just file in a pull request and be very open. Some of the things that actually have come out, for example, the R API, the, the scatter plot, how you actually use it, has actually come from open source community. And so we're very open. We're still in alpha 0.8. And we are very, very uh, conducive to people actually putting uh, PR requests. And we, we evaluate the requests on a daily basis, and we create releases on, 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 on sprint, on bi-weekly bi basis. And so if you think that you actually need that, please, please, please file a PR request. Right. And I'll be there to actually take it and take it to the right people to say, okay, we need CNTK because we have people actually using it, right? Because we're actually deploying our Microsoft Azure ML, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that CNTK right now. But because TensorFlow and Keras is now very much integrated and sort of a default platform, a lot of people use that. But I don't see, I don't see any, any um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, there's nothing that actually stops us from, from you finding a PI request and we approving it and making that part of that. The more, the more models we have, uh, the more open it becomes and people who come from wide, dire, virus, uh, a diverse set of um, skills can actually use that. Any other question you have? Yeah, we have a question in the back up there. So if you just go to uh, mlflow.org, we got documentation over there, and we have uh, the GitHub repository, and you'll see um, all the code examples. And if you actually follow the, the URL that I gave you, you'll be able to run this experiment, no problem, on your own. Uh, pip install mlflow, it's very easy. Import mlflow, start hacking on your local machine. You'll love it, literally. It's, it's, it's you know. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, we just, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I just to ask if you have any plan to include as a service, not as an installation, the part of uh, MLflow registry and all of these parts. Good question. Good question. I think I think what, you, what you're actually asking is is how do you actually deal with metadata and how you actually deal with with governance. And if you look at the the cycle that I actually provided, you know the governance is actually the last part. And on the roadmap that I was going to show right now, because we are out of time. Uh, one of the things we actually want to do now is the last stage, which is the provenance and the governance, because I think without that, uh, it's like pasta without garlic. You got to have that right as part of it. And I think we are we are working diligently to cut the releases where we actually now have the entire accountability by saying, I want to actually not only register who did the experiment, who ran the experiment, when they ran the experiment, were they allowed to run the experiment? You know, can I actually go to the registry to find out what the access control how to all those are back which are part of the enterprise requirements are, are going to be part of it. Remember, this is, we just really 0.80 is still in its preliminary stages. And I think it's important right now to, to get the, the community galvanized and start contributing that. And I believe as an advocate, and I believe the company that I work for who were the creators of Apache Spark that, that lightning can actually strike twice. Because what happened with Apache Spark was not only the, the community actually contributed quite a bit, and it really, really has taken off. See what's happened with TensorFlow. You have Google who actually released it, but the community is actually behind it. And we feel that we can actually do the same thing with MLflow, whereby we actually create uh, a lot of PR requests from, from, from you guys. And I think you can actually contribute that, and you can actually take it and help us to go to the next level. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yes. So last year in our team, we started to work with MLIP with the idea of serialized models mm -hmm. from scikit-learn or mm -hmm. from Spark. And don't worry too much about which uh, technology we're mm -hmm. using. But uh, soon we, are, we realized that it was not so easy because in, Psyche, uh, in MLIP mm -hmm. uh, it's not supported some of the transformers yes. that we have in Spark. Uh, could uh, MLflow uh, help 
us with uh, this kind of issues? I think that that's a good question. The question is, you know, um, MLLib has certain, certain, certain restrictions. Um, you know, what is it that MLFool can actually do? Because as you notice that MLLib is one of the flavors that we actually, in Scikit-Learn, you can store as MLLib. And they are customized um, additions that you can actually put in your model. So when you actually export, when you deploy your model, one of the customized things would be the call and the transformation that you actually, that you actually employ or you deploy that you write, and then that can actually be part of that particular code. And so, yes, we have plans to, to, to document that and provide um, a code snippets to see how you can actually write your custom transform in the MLlib model when you actually save that. So when you run, your entry point not becomes the predict, but becomes the transformation that you actually want to do. Anybody else? Well, if none, then thank you, thank you for coming. I'm sorry about the demo, but I'm going to be at my Databricks booth. Come by, and I can actually give you a personal demo. Uh, thank you.